Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Roger Destruti. And as you know, every month we strive to bring a new department or program or service, some information to uh, discuss and hopefully give you a better feel for the very important roles and responsibilities of county government. And of our 19 departments, one of the largest with a $31 million budget is our Health and Human Services Department. And with us today is our Health and Human Services Director, Tom Agerbrecht. Welcome, Tom. Thanks, Adam. Happy holidays, by the way. Happy holidays, and happy <laughs> holidays to you. We're going to get a brief overview of the very important roles and responsibilities of Health and Human Services. And as one of our largest departments, it's difficult to really drill down too far because there is so much going on. So let's, let's jump right in here. Please begin, Tom, by sharing a little bit about the core services of the Health and Human Services Department. Sure. Uh, all counties in Wisconsin, Adam, are required to provide uh, safety net services for persons who are vulnerable as well as assure health and uh, well-being overall for county populations. We do that over the course of four operating divisions. So we have a division of economic support, which operates at our job center on Wilgus Avenue. We have an aging and disability resource center in Sheboygan Falls. Um, in our main building downtown, we have our Division of Public Health, Division of Social Services, and Division of Community Programs. And we also provide services um, to the Sheboygan Area School District as part of our programming under the Division of Social Services. We have three staff uh, stationed at Tower Academy School. So four divisions and approximately how many staff do you have in total? And Give us a sense of that 31 million and where predominantly those dollars are being allocated. Yeah, we have 180 staff. Uh, and again, they're operating across those work locations, as I indicated. Uh, our $31 million budget is about 60% state and federal, and the balance of that gets made up through local levies. So that's about a $13 million annual contribution to services. And you have uh, developed, particularly the last few years, an outstanding track record with your budget management and of course as Roger and our county board and the public would expect we expect all departments to work within their budget parameters the county board approves the budget and department heads are expected to work within those parameters but of course a budget process is not a crystal ball and depending on the department things can happen that may blow that budget out of the water and you may want to give an example of something that can stress your budget but Back to my point, you have done an excellent job working within your budget parameters. Give us a sense of you know, how challenging is it and what are some of those situations that can make it difficult to work with budget parameters? Well, um, first of all, when we talk about our budget and we talk about the success that we've had, I think a lot of that credit needs to go to our staff and our contracted partners. So we've, we've taken a couple of approaches in recent years that I think uh, position us better to respond to situations, help us achieve a positive budget performance. One of those things is we've uh, shared decision-making and program planning and budget management uh, with all levels of our organization. I think that's still a work in progress. Um, you might be familiar with medical studies where patients who control their own medication tend to need less medication than when it's controlled by others. So similar concept when we involve our staff in decisions about spending and about programs and about services, it brings it to the front line and it, it results in, in better outcomes many times. So that's number one. Number two, and you asked about what are some of those things that would cause our budget to um, be a little bit out of control or beyond our control. And one of those things is use of institutional settings. So as an example, uh, for mental health inpatient care, that's about $1,000 per day. Uh, for juvenile corrections placement, that's about $300 per day. So insofar as our staff can develop approaches that keep people out of those settings when it's appropriate to do so, there's significant savings to be had. Um, we also encourage, I guess, innovation and contribution on the part of our staff as to what new approaches may produce better outcomes. We focused a lot on 
evidence-based practices, those things that have been proven through research to produce positive results. Many of our program staff are being immersed in those approaches right now. I also, when I have a chance to meet with new employees, I tell them spend less time assimilating to work the way it's done and spend more time thinking about the way it might be done and feel confident in bringing those suggestions forward. So all of those things are in play. We've had great, great success. I think we've uh, realized about five or six million dollars in savings um, over budget uh, in the last five years, and I think we're on pace to accomplish a similar outcome this year. But as you make reference to, at the end of the day, there's a huge amount of luck that goes with that as well. So we are, we are extremely fortunate and extremely blessed. Good management and good fortune is how I always put it, because uh, you do an excellent job with your budget estimates and your projections. And of course, you involve your staff, you have a very collaborative process, and, and it's worked well. But when I say when you can have a stressor or something that can uh, make it very difficult on the budget or is out of your control, I'm sure some of our viewers might be thinking, well, you always, I mean, even if something's out of your control, you better stay within your budget. You can move and reprioritize, and that's true. But for example, I know if Marty Bonk was with us today, who after 30 years is going to be retiring from our Health and Human Services Department. Every time we sit down during the budget development process, Marty will help develop those projections and estimates and he will uh, gently warn all of us and say, however, mm -hmm. all it takes is one juvenile gang fight or uh, you know, a, a spike in some inappropriate decisions and behavior that mm -hmm. can impact that budget. And then also, as we both know, if you have uh, elderly abuse mm -hmm. or child abuse or something like that that's reported and those numbers increase or spike one year, we can't say, oh, we don't have the money for that. We have to respond. And again, you, you and your staff have done just a tremendous job. Oh, thank you. Um, last time we talked, we spoke a little bit about the building addition, and I hope many of our viewers have had an opportunity to drive by the Health and Human Services Department and see how close we are to completing that building addition. Please wind it back a little bit and set the stage. What was the need or impetus for adding on what's going to be about a two, $2.1 million building addition? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our building uh, was constructed in 1921, I think, served many years as the Sheboygan Clinic. Uh, medical facility and it was never intended for use as a, a composite health and human services department and as a byproduct of that it hasn't been set up quite as efficiently as we'd like to have it for our application. County acquired that building I think in the late 80s maybe 1989 or so and what I can give you by way of example is um, the lobby in that building is is so small it will accommodate seven or eight people at a time comfortably. Um, so visitors are cleared to interior spaces in our building and typically wait in hallways uh, while they're trying to connect with program staff. So privacy and information security are compromised. Um, we get about 250 visitors per day. We have one accessible restroom in the entire building that's located in a far corner of the third floor and our meeting rooms are, are inadequate to serve our workforce of 180 employees. So all of those factors together have suggested that uh, if we could improve our entrance to the building and add a few uh, enhancements to that entrance, we would have much improved efficiencies. And when you say one accessible bathroom. You yep. don't mean there's only one bathroom in the entire building. No, I'm sorry. It's one handicapped one handicapped accessible. accessible. That's exactly yes. right. So again, at the period in time that building was constructed, it's interesting to see today the doorways on most of those restrooms are 24 inches wide. And when you throw molding on the side of those doorways, they're 23 inches wide you'd never get a wheelchair through there. So when I talk about accessible restroom, mm -hmm. thanks for that clarification, mm -hmm. it's the only one in the building that would mm -hmm. allow a person in a wheelchair to be able to get through. For those of you who have ever flown in an airplane or <laughs> taken a bus tour somewhere that has a 
bus bathroom in the back, which isn't the case with most buses. But for those of you who have experienced that and squeezed into that little airport bathroom or airplane bathroom or bus bathroom, um, many, many of our restrooms at the Health and Human Services Department are like that. So when Tom made the case for it is time to improve upon this, it wasn't a difficult challenge from a bathroom situation because those are just tiny bathrooms. I, I, uh, I've joked around with Tom in the past and I don't know how many of our viewers have ever seen the movie with Chris Farley and his bathroom scene in an airplane. I don't recall the name of the, air, the movie anymore. Do you or not, Tom? Um, uh, was that trains, planes, and automobiles? I'm, I don't I'm not think even, it. I think different movie. Different movie. Like I Chris don't, Farley I, oh, bathroom Chris, I'm, scene yeah, okay, I don't know. in an airplane. If John any Candy. of you have seen it, you know what I'm talking about. It is, uh, it's uh, a hilarious scene, and it's one that can play out in our department. And more seriously, you've shared with me, Tom, that if someone's had an infant and needs to go to that bathroom and change the child or anything like that, there just literally isn't room. You almost have to hold the door open or closed with your foot. Well, yeah, I think what you're referring to there is um, our public health division is uh, located on the third floor of our building. And um, there's a restroom directly across from our reception desk there. And as you allude to, there, there's no um, changing tables in those restrooms. They can accommodate one person at a time and there's no locks on the door. Right. So uh, as a byproduct of that, we have had mothers you know, changing babies' diapers on the floor uh, in that restroom. And, and our staff, you know, thank goodness for our staff, keep an eye out so that no one inadvertently opens the door on a baby in that situation. So it's, it's, not, it's not a tenable circumstance. It's amazing we got by this number of years the way we did, but it's time to improve that. It, it was time, and it was yeah. time, and thankfully because of your budget surpluses, because you had a track record for a few years of coming in under budget, we were able to support, or the county board mm -hmm. ultimately approve this addition and not have to tap into any additional revenue or bond, bond or borrow for mm -hmm. it. We were able to use those surplus funds. Right. In addition to restrooms, what are other practical improvements associated with this building addition? Well, as I mentioned, it all starts with our lobby space. Uh, that has been woefully inadequate. Uh, we've had to clear people to the interior of the building uh, when they're waiting to be seen. Uh, first of all, we'll have a large waiting room. We'll increase from six or seven persons who can wait at a time to 30 persons who can wait at a time. We'll have centralized reception now. So rather than having separate reception staff in five spots in our building, we're going to have three receptionists working in that main lobby. On the upper level, we're going to have a large meeting room. Uh, currently, our, our largest conference room in the building will accommodate 40 persons at a time. Workforce of 180, again, there's a, a terrible mismatch between those numbers. So the new conference room on the second floor of this addition will accommodate 128 persons comfortably, perhaps a bit more if needed. Uh, we'll have a nice uh, break room in there for staff to use. And we're also adding a nurse on call office right off the lobby, an immunization office right off the lobby. And uh, among budget initiatives for the new year, we're adding central information and assistance staff who will also be, have an office in that lobby area to help visitors navigate not only through our system, but community systems of care as well. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Tom. Turn it over to you, Roger. Thank you, Adam. Uh, it's great to see the improvements going on there. It's much needed and uh, will be appreciated by the staff and the visitors that are needed there. We also have uh, a facility in Sheboygan Falls, the um, Disability, let's see the name, Aging and Disability Resource Center officially. Mm -hmm. And we've got a building project going on there. Would you explain a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, very similar to, to our main offices downtown. The site that's occupied by our Aging and Disability Resource Center uh, was not intended for its current application. So as a byproduct of that, entrance into that building is uh, through the back of the building, off the parking lot, through a service door. There's no protection uh, from the elements for visitors. Uh, the north wind blowing off that lot goes directly into the offices. Uh, there's no, no means of breaking that 
uh, that the force of that wind and then also the reception area inside that building is tucked away. It's not too far from the entrance, but it is tucked away uh, in, in an office area um, adjacent to the entrance, so it's not immediately visible. So those uh, shortcomings are also going to be corrected. Uh, there will be a canopy added over that entrance. That door is going to be replaced. A vestibule is going to be added inside to provide better protection uh, from, from the wind. And then also a new reception area is being created immediately inside that building. So as a visitor, you immediately know where reception is. And the receptionist will have you know, line of sight uh, opportunity to see who's coming and going. So many, many improvements and going to be very much appreciated there as well. And when do we expect that project to be complete? That um, should be done by the end of this year. We got a little bit of a late start, but I spoke with uh, Jim Tabeast of our Building Services Department this morning. He indicated that we're on schedule to be uh, wrapped up by year end, so we look forward to that. And I know our staff and many community partners are also uh, helping with a patio area. You want to explain a little bit about that? Sure. That's also at the Aging and Disability Resource Center. So um, that particular site, um, in addition to providing eligibility determination for long-term care programs and offering other information, also provides senior programming and serves as a, a senior dining site for the Sheboygan Falls area. And one of our staff members, a gal named Kathy Manny, came to me back in January and said, you know what, it'd be really nice if in this site we could develop some outdoor programming space. She had a vision for a patio installation out there. She drew it on a piece of paper very crudely, and she said it would be great, and she believed that we could get community uh, participation and support to get that thing done. And she partnered with Jill Spielvogel of our staff, who's one of our program aides out there. And Jill is just so amazing in terms of her connections and her motivation. And she did go out and enlist the uh, support of many community partners who donated good service and labor to get that thing done. And I'm confident I'm not going to remember all of them, but Haymeister Architects uh, donated the drawing for that project. Uh, Jill's husband, who has an excavating business, helped with some of the land preparation. Uh, we had Stecker Construction involved, Vandervart Concrete involved, uh, Restoration Gardens designed a, um, a, a landscaping plan, if you will. Otter Creek uh, Landscaping was involved, Mustard Seed was involved, Superior Lawn and Garden was involved. And it all came together with the assistance of the Volunteer Center uh, who was signed a work crew and get all of that work done, got all of that work done in one day back in July. So it really, really was a nice effort. It started as a simple concept on the part of a singular staff member and it took shape and uh, they can be very, very proud of that. And I know too that the seniors who use that site did immediately take to that space and it's a big, big improvement for them. Great, great to see an improvement like that, and, and the staff sees a need, and uh, they follow through on it. And Absolutely. Great help. Absolutely. With uh, some of these building projects, that obviously got some uh, effort and uh, monies from, donated from others, but the mm -hmm. big uh, project at the Health and Human Services building, and mm -hmm. it falls, where did the bulk of that money come from? We touched on sure. it before. Sure, yeah. So as Adam referenced, um, our, our positive budget performance in recent years positioned us well uh, to utilize some of our fund balance for uh, that uh, building project downtown. And in terms of the Aging and Disability Resource Center, we operate that program through a state contract that's uh, basically a self-sufficient uh, funding source, if you will, that does not require levy contribution. There again, we had some positive variance from last year that was carried into this year and permission from the state to apply that uh, carryover for this particular purpose. So in both cases, uh, we are able to get those projects done within the limits of operating budgets we've otherwise had and not had to rely upon additional bonding or other sources. So again, very, very fortunate. And these big projects take uh, some help from other departments within the county, too. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you explain uh, the ones that helped with it? Yeah, in, in particular, big shout-out goes to Jim Tabeast, uh, our building services director, 
Um, Jim has been there every step of the way. Um, we had to replace the, uh, the east facade of our main building uh, a couple of years ago, back in 2012. It had a stucco surface that was beginning to deteriorate. It was absorbing water, so on and so forth. So when Jim came to me and said we needed to replace that, that facade with what is now some uh, tile paneling, I guess you could call it, uh, my request of Jim was let's do this in a way that does not prevent the consideration of future addition or let's not do it in a way that causes waste through that process. So Jim did involve an architect at that stage as far back as 2012 to conceptualize what that would look like and Jim has been there every step of the way. I know that he takes a lot of questions, at times a lot of grief from us as a workforce in terms of um, this, work sur this uh, walking surface is too rough or there's too much dust or there's too much noise and Jim has been great, great to work with and so I've so much appreciated his help. But then also Bernie Romer and Bernie works as a purchasing agent for the county and city both and uh, Bernie is, is, he is just a can-do guy and if you ever have a chance to to say hello to Bernie, I would encourage viewers to do so because he's a tremendous guy, can-do guy, and uh, he's helped us acquire all of the furnishings. Uh, he says, what, what do you need this thing to do? And he goes out and he gets it and he just makes it so, so easy. So those guys have both been a pleasure to work with. Well, thanks for all the work that you and your, your division managers and all the people at Health and Human Services do for our county. Thanks, thanks Roger. Again. As we have this discussion, and it's kind of ironic to me that we're talking about building and infrastructure improvements for health and human services because of the 19 departments. If there is a department that has probably be, been the most frugal when it comes to asking for any structural enhancements or new furniture or new computers or whatever it might be, it has been the health and human services department. Why? because their focus has always been on the clients and the services we provide to the clients and making sure that we do the best we can with the money we have for the clients. And so let's, let's return to some of the pr important programming and services that your staff provide. Uh, recently, you and I both had a chance to participate in a community conversation to improve mm -hmm. mental health services mm -hmm. access. Uh, some people who might be falling between the cracks or there wasn't necessarily yep. the, the uh, chain of information and people being sure that mm -hmm. they're getting in the right hands. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about your 2016, I'm sorry, 2015, I'm already thinking 2016, 2015 budget and some of the new initiatives, programs that uh, the county board supported that are going to help people in this community. Sure, happy to, Adam. Yeah, you made reference to this community conversation on mental health. That was an event that took place back in March at Blue Harbor. Um, really, uh, it was an opportunity for people who had interest or concern about provision of mental health services in Sheboygan County to come together and identify gaps. And um, one of those things that was a recurring theme that we heard on that particular day was that it's difficult for people to navigate through the system and even for people who are working within the system mm -hmm. to know what others are doing to right. know what their you know sister agencies might be doing right. is extremely difficult we all get busy doing what we do we don't spend enough time understanding what others do so as a consumer you keep hitting closed doors and it's kind of a hit or miss proposition as to where you go for assistance so i mentioned earlier that one of the things we'll be adding within our system of care is information and assistance staff. We'll have two staff stationed right in that lobby to provide information and referral assistance, program enrollment assistance, functional screening assistance, not only for the services we provide, but to help people navigate through community systems as well. Secondly, we'll be adding uh, case management staff in our area of behavioral health. We've heard about this for a long period of time. Again, it's difficult for people to navigate uh, through systems, so we'll be adding one additional case management position. Um, in our social services area, so many of the kids and, and families that 
enter that program area, whether through child protective services or juvenile justice services, have early indications of mental health or substance use issues. And uh, we're going to be expanding our provision of uh, mental health supports, if you will, for that population. We want to embed that resource right in the work side by side that's being done uh, in our social services division. Um, we're looking to develop some detox services in response to the heroin epidemic. So we've heard a lot over the past year about uh, the, the rise in the use of heroin, the impact it's having in the community. Right now, there's not a good detox opportunity in Sheboygan County, so we want to get started on that and hope to come up with some resources there. And then lastly, I also want to mention that um, youth aging out of foster care. Uh, if you think about a young person, 18 years of age, who's been separated from family, who's been in foster care and is now emancipated from foster care, and how equipped that young person might be to deal with life and the challenges that come along with life, um, it's, it's a, a troubling picture at best. So we're going to be partnering with uh, Manitowoc, uh, Kiwani, and Door Counties. We're actually partnering already. We've received a grant from the state that will be carried into the new year to provide supportive assistance, daily living skills instruction, job uh, placement assistance, and um, I guess assuring that those kids land in good, comfortable spots and understand what it takes to maintain a household, so on and so forth. So very excited about that. That's also long overdue. Great summary, great overview. A lot going on at the Health and Human Services Department and all these new initiatives actually weren't done with new money. They were done by reprioritizing within the budget that Tom worked with last mm -hmm. year and the year before. Uh, because uh, not only Health and Human Services, but every department is being asked to do more with less and reprioritize and focus on the needs. And my compliments, Tom, to you and your team and listening to the community and making some improvements. Look forward to that. Thank you for joining us today. We're, believe it or not, that 30 minutes went by quickly, a lot of information. If you want to learn more about Health and Human Services, have some questions about some programs, know someone in need who needs to get connected with the right person, don't hesitate to contact Tom Agerbrecht or any member of our team, and we'll be sure we refer you to the right person. Our county clerk's office is always a real good resource to refer people, the county administrator, your county board supervisor, or check out our website. But Tom, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you for your good work. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate it. Next month, Rebecca Persick, our family court commissioner, is going to be here to talk about the very important roles and responsibilities of the court commissioner's office, and until then, have a wonderful Thanksgiving, a wonderful Christmas, and best wishes.